Robots Radio presents... In 2004, director Alfonso Cuaron gave the world a mysterious new foray into our favorite school of witchcraft and wizardry. In 2020, we try the first in a line of experimental bourbons. The film is Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. The whiskey is Jefferson's Small Batch. And we'll review them both. This is the, the Film, film and, and Whiskey, whiskey Podcast. Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at the 2004 film Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Harry! Expecto Patronum! Brad, it is a good morning to be drinking some whiskey and reviewing some movies. We are recording this at 9.45 in the morning, and we're getting mm -mm -mm. our day drinking on. Let's do it, my friend. <laughs> and we are returning to the world of Harry Potter. We decided last season that we were going to do two Harry Potter films for four seasons straight to kind of knock them out. We didn't want to do one each season and really, really stretch this out. And I actually think it's really cool the way that these fell, Brad, in the pairs that we're doing them in. You know, the first two movies were directed by Chris Columbus, and this season we're looking at Harry Potter number three and Harry Potter number four. And if I'm being honest, Brad, these might be the two Harry Potter films that I have the most conflicting feelings about. Yeah, honestly, Bob, for me, I, I remember watching the first one a few times as a kid. But I, I had never really like liked Harry Potter. I never read the books. So for me, watching the fourth one, you know, the Goblet of Fire, that's the first time I really remember sitting down and watching Harry Potter. I was probably like 15, 16 years old. And that so that for me really was like my first entry into the film universe of Harry Potter. Yeah, Brad, I'm actually right there with you. For a long time, Goblet of Fire was my favorite Harry Potter movie growing up. And, you know, we've watched it again, and we will have thoughts on that one in next week's episode. But today, the task ahead of us is to review Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. This movie has always been viewed by critics and by, you know, sort of cinephiles, I guess, as the best of the Harry Potter movies. And that has a lot to do with the director, Alfonso Cuaron. This is a guy who, since making this movie, has won two Academy Awards for Best Director. He is considered one of the best working directors today. And here he is making a Harry Potter movie, you know, 16 years ago. And I think at the time, people noticed that there was a huge kind of tonal shift in this movie from the, the sort of, you know, golden-hued, happy-themed one and two to this kind of darker, edgier one we get in number three. But I don't know if at the time people recognized a lot of the kind of directorial trademarks that Quaron brought to the table. But watching it now, you know, and after having watched all the movies he's made since then, Children of Men and Gravity and Roma, I can go back and I'm like, oh, my gosh, this guy was at the top of his game in a kid's movie and really didn't get the credit for it until, you know, he started winning Oscars. And then we can go back and, and recognize what a masterful filmmaker he really is. Yeah, Bob, when you're watching this film, especially after having just like seen the first two, you you will immediately notice, oh, this is this is different. This is on a whole nother level from what we were working with in the first two. And I think, you know, what we said about Chris Columbus still rings true in my ears that he was perfect for the first two movies. But even by the time you get through the end of the second movie, you realize that he's not the director that that should carry, you know, the Harry Potter franchise all the way through to the end. Yeah. And, and this is kind of like the first thing I'll say about my conflicting feelings about this, Brad, is that I think that the shift in tone between Chamber of Secrets and uh, Prisoner of Azkaban is just too jarring. Was it the right move to make? Yes. And I think if you watch the rest of the films in the series, they all take their cues from the sort of mood and tone and color palette that Quaron sets here. But to go from the second film to the third film is such a jarring shift that I almost feel like, did I miss one in between here? 
Like, there should have been some sort of bridge movie that walked us a little bit more easily into this really glaring difference in tone. But my conflicting feeling is, like, it was the right thing to do for the series. It's what the series needed as it grew darker. It just almost feels like 3 through 8 and 1 and 2 are in completely different categories. It's almost like they don't belong to the same film series in a way. Does that make sense? Oh, it it totally does. What, one of the things that kind of helped me get over that shift, because it, it is a big shift, and, and I'm right there with you, Bob. And I'm not sure if this might have been partially just how Quaron decided to film his young stars, but Emma Watson, Rupert Grint, and Daniel Radcliffe look so much older in this film than they did in the second film. Yeah. So like there there was a sense in my mind of like I it, you know logically I know that it's just the next year of school only one summer has passed but for some reason man you could tell that they had grown up a decent amount between the two movies and along with them growing up the the way the movies grew up you know what I mean Absolutely and part of that has to do with the fact that this is the first film where the production company decided they would release a Harry Potter movie every 18 months instead of every year. And so starting with this movie, from Chamber of Secrets to this one was 18 months, and then there's 18 subsequent months between every movie after that. And so your actors are aging a year and a half between movies. The characters are only supposed to be aging a year. And you're right, Brad, it really does seem like they grew a lot just physically in between these films. The official party line that everybody was towing was that Chris Columbus decided not to come back for a third movie to spend more time with his family, which is always <laughs> what they officially say when things like this happen. I would like to spend more time with my family as I leave this lucrative job. Right. So they approached a number of directors uh, for this third film. They talked to Guillermo del Toro. They talked to Mark Forster, who actually ended up directing a movie in this year called Finding Neverland. Uh, they talked to M. Night Shyamalan about making a Harry Potter movie. And all of them passed on it. And so they landed on Alfonso Cuaron. And Cuaron had actually never read the Harry Potter books. He had made one sort of children's themed movie before. And he said, I don't really know if I want to do this. And his buddy Guillermo del Toro, who had passed on directing, sat him down and basically cussed him out to his face and was like, you haven't even read the books. How can you pass on this? You need to go down to the bookstore right now and get these Harry Potter books. And so Quaron read the first three books and was like, yeah, I'm sucked into this world. I will absolutely make this movie. And I think, Brad, the product that we have is something really, really special. I'm excited to get into talking about it with you. But before we get too far down the rabbit hole here, I think we need to kind of hit pause and explain this movie. That seems like a wise idea. And we might need to move into Phil and Whiskey's favorite segment, Brad Explains. Brad Explains is where Brad breaks down the plot of the movie that he has just seen. A lot of times he's watching these movies for the first time. That is not the case today. This is a tried and true favorite in the Brad G household. So I am excited to hear what you have to say. Brad, will you break down a spoilerific review of The Prisoner of Azkaban? Bob, I will say for, for how much my wife loves the Harry Potter universe... I think this might have been only my third time seeing it. Wow. Which is almost close to have never having seen it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so so this is my third time through the movie. Um, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban follows the lives primarily of Harry Potter, um, but also his friends Hermione Granger and Ronald Weasley. Um, the three of them are best friends. They are young witches and wizards that attend the school of Hogwarts. This year, they are set up to go back to school, and it is found out that there is this demented, crazy prisoner who has escaped from the wizard prison of Azkaban, and that this prisoner um, supposedly was the one who had given up Harry Potter's parents when Harry was a child to the evil Lord Voldemort. And Voldemort was able to find his parents. He tried to kill Harry, but the curse rebounded, and it, it destroyed Voldemort for a time. So this this prisoner that hates Harry for killing his Lord, evil Lord Voldemort is on the loose, and it's it's found out that he's trying to chase down Harry. And the movie from there progresses as a mystery. They start seeing shadows in every corner. They have a divination class where the the professor keeps seeing death over Harry. And by the end of the film, you find out that it is much, much more complicated than they realized. 
that this pet rat that his friend Ron owns is actually a polymorphed human named Peter Pettigrew, who was the person who actually betrayed Harry's parents, and that the escaped prisoner, Sirius Black, is the one who is trying to, he's trying to track down Peter Pettigrew and kill him for betraying his best friend, James Potter. And by the end of the film, Sirius is being taken to be executed, and Peter Pettigrew is escaping, and they find out that Harry's friend Hermione has a time turner, and that this time turner allows you to travel back in the past. So we get an awesome time travel sequence where Harry and Hermione go back in time, retrace their footsteps, Uh, they fight a werewolf, they fight a bunch of these things called Dementors, which suck the happiness and life out of humans that are nearby. And Harry finds a lot more confidence in in himself as a wizard. And they end up freeing Sirius. They get him away from the execution that awaits him. And they move forward into the Black Knight. Yeah, that Brad, that was actually a really good explanation because this is maybe the most complex story in the whole Harry Potter universe. There is so much going on here. And... I want to get into talking about that story and the complexity of it a little bit later. But before we get into that, I want to finish talking about Alfonso Cuaron as a director. You know, typically when we come out of Brad Explains, we start talking about the quality of the acting in the movie. And, you know, we can touch on some of that a little bit. But I really think that for the first time in this series, the star of the film is really the director. This is the first time that I felt like there was, you know, and I don't want to just bandy this word about, but like there was there was a genius behind the camera. There was someone here who had such a unifying vision that like the the look of the film makes sense. The tone of the film makes sense. The costumes, the you know, the way that the magic is physically represented, the the Patronus charm when it's conjured up, like everything in this movie seems like there was a very deliberate methodical person behind the camera making those decisions and in a way that you really didn't get with the first two films like in the first two movies it kind of seemed like yeah we're gonna go for a darker tone here but a lighter tone here and we're gonna kind of throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks we're gonna design the spiders to look like this and the trolls to look like this and it's kind of a grab bag of things in the first two movies in this one it's like Everything seems to fit. The design elements are all perfectly executed. And it really does seem like the first movie in this series where everything is kind of unified. Yeah, Bob, I I think that in general, this might be too simplified, but the first two Harry Potter movies were made for children. And this movie was made for adults. Mm. Like, I... I understand that children still went and saw this movie, and I don't think that Quaron put anything in there that would make it unfit for children. So, you know, it's still a movie that children should and can watch, but it, it, it's not made for kids anymore. This is an adult version of the Harry Potter universe, and and you see it in just the little things. You know, Quaron is willing to sit with the characters for long periods of time. He's willing to take big, wide, swooping shots of the scenery and what's happening. And, you know, one of the first things I noticed about this movie was, man, this cinematography is just flat out beautiful. Yeah. You know, there's so many shots of, you know, the valley and the train going through the valley or Hogwarts off in the distance. He just spends so much time over all these beautiful locations That, you know, are they necessary to the film? Possibly not. But do they make it a breathtakingly beautiful film? It definitely does. Yeah, so there was two big things that I noticed that he did really well. And on paper, it seems like they're contradictory things. But he found a way to to pull them together. And the first is that he really leans heavily into, like, the gothic horror look of things. You know, they started using a different location for a lot of the Hogwarts exteriors. And if you watch the movie, you can tell they've completely redesigned what Hogwarts looks like. But they really lean heavily into, you know, these these high vaulted ceilings, the pointy (laughs) tops of buildings, the swinging pendulums of clocks. It has this sort of gothic horror element to it. And even the design of the Dementors, the design of the werewolf, it has this classic sort of 1800s horror element to it. And yet at the same time, what I really love about Quaron is he also knows that he needs to make this world look more lived in. I think in a few sequences in the first two movies, you could tell 
that it was a set that was built on a soundstage somewhere. And what Cuaron does a really good job of is kind of dirtying up the place a little bit. When he first signed on to the movie, the things that he circled as his priorities were the sets and the costumes. And so he told the kids, you know, when you're wearing your school uniforms, I want you to wear them as if you were wearing them in real life and your parents weren't around. So they have a more relaxed look to them. You know, they they took the idea to J.K. Rowling of when these kids aren't in their uniforms, can they wear street clothes? And she was like, yeah, they would wear street clothes. And so you finally see them wearing street clothes around Hogwarts on their days off from school. It really creates this this really realistic sort of lived in world. I love the design of the leaky cauldron in London, that it's just like in the middle of this dirty, rundown London alley. And Harry's looking out the window and there's just like muggles fighting on the street. It, it makes it seem like the world of magic really is in the world that we live in and not a completely separate thing. And I think that he balances those two elements really, really well. And on top of those things, I, I think my one of my favorite parts about Quaron's direction in this movie is the cinematography. I really, really love the way he moves a camera. You know, he he doesn't necessarily keep the camera right on his characters. He allows the camera to kind of wander around columns or pillars as his characters walk around, move, talk, have conversations. You know, one of the most famous scenes from the movie is is near the beginning when uh, Ron Weasley's dad takes Harry to the side and Mr. Weasley kind of has this conversation with Harry, like saying, hey, man, you know, not many people would tell you this. But I think you're old enough to know and that you deserve to know. But like this dude who escaped from Azkaban, he, he might be coming for you. And, and I just want you to not, you know, just be careful when you're at Hogwarts. And it's this long conversation that they have at the Leaky Cauldron. And the camera movement in that scene is just literal perfection. Yeah, it's it's an unbroken shot that lasts almost two minutes. And what Quaron is really doing well in this movie is he knows when the camera needs to be constantly moving, like in the in the very first sequence inside the Great Hall, there's 10 or 11 shots in a row where the camera doesn't actually sit still. It's constantly moving, and it gives you this idea of navigating the space, which is really, really vital to this movie, because by the end of the film, what's happening is you have Harry and Hermione going back in time and retracing their steps from before. And so what they do in that whole last 45-minute sequence is a lot of times they're giving an alternate camera angle of a place you've already been before. And because of the way that they've navigated the space, you completely understand the geography of where these characters are. You can understand that, okay, there's here's future Harry and future Hermione over in this corner, and there's past Harry and past Hermione over there. And he he's able to tell a really complex narrative through filmmaking language. And it's because he is so adept at moving that camera around but he doesn't do it in unnecessary ways. Like if you just pulled some of the shots out of this movie, Brad, there are some really, really complex shots going on here. There's one scene in Professor Lupin's class, uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts, where they're, they're going to conjure up this thing called a boggart. And it lives basically in this wardrobe. And there's a shot where you see the whole class in the mirror of the wardrobe and the camera pushes into the mirror, but then it comes out of the mirror and and the, like, I don't I can't even explain how it works. I don't know how they achieve that shot. Like, there's obviously something digital going on there as well. But it's such an effective shot because it doesn't draw attention to itself. The camera has been moving for so long that you're just used to Quaron pulling off these really masterful, tricky shots. And again, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves and talk about Goblet of Fire. But every decision in this movie seems intentional and deliberate. And when you go to watch another Harry Potter movie in the series that is directed by, you know, a lesser director, I think it becomes even more obvious just how masterful Quaron is. Now, I, I will say we we've been heaping praise here the whole time. So I, I'm going to pull back a tiny bit. I think that there was a lot of moments in this movie that I, I just didn't totally understand why they happened. And, and maybe not a lot, but there's a few moments where. I think that some of the actors delivered their lines like way too fast. And I'm like, how, like, how did Coron not slow them down a little bit and be like, hey, man, you don't have to deliver nine sentences in one mm. breath. Um, that was a problem that I noticed a few times in this movie. Um, there's a few other moments where I felt like they were making like little gags or like funny jokes that 
that just kind of fell really flat for me. Yeah, that's a I, Brad. I, honestly, like I think that's one of the the big drawbacks of this movie is that it seems like in the first half of the movie, they're still trying to do those sort of whimsical gags that you would get in the first and second movies, and it doesn't work well because you're immediately hit with this visual tone where like everything has this sort of greenish hue to it. Like it looks like we're in the matrix and it's very obviously going for this darker, grittier sort of feel. And then you get like Aunt Marge blowing up like a balloon. So like the, the first half hour, especially for me, where they're really trying to go back and forth between is this more serious or is this still a kid's movie? Those didn't work for me at all. Yeah, Bob. And and part of that is like, you know, certain things like Aunt Marge blowing up, like that's a part of the book. And it's one of the key reasons, you know, that we see Harry Potter leave the Dursley's house and get on the bus. But like it's stuff like the Jamaican bobbleheads that are like hanging in the bus. Yeah. And the whole like, yeah, uh, why is your face so long? And you're like, what what's happening here? And then he brings those same things back at Madame Ro- Rosemerta's later in the movie at, in Hogsmeade. And you're like, wait a second. Is it just like a thing in the wizarding world to have like small Jamaican bobblehead things? Shrunken that, heads. Like, yeah. Yeah. Shrunken heads. That there, there was stuff like that that I'm like, wait a second. What? <laughs> like, what is this? So while some parts like Aunt Marge blowing up, I'm kind of like, okay, fine. Like that's a little bit of an awkward thing, but it kind of had to be in the script. But there's other parts of the script that I'm like, uh, like you said, Bob, this, the movie is not visually going for this, but the script was going for a gaggy, funny thing that just didn't always fit. Yeah. And it might be just because Quaron is at the helm here. But I do get the sense, though, that they know when to stop doing that. Like when the story really kicks in and especially the crazy thing about this movie. And I said we were going to get into talking about the complexity of the narrative. But you basically get the climax of the movie around an hour and a half in where they finally get confronted by Sirius Black. They corner him, you know, in this uh, in the Shrieking Shack, this old haunted house. And you get this crazy fake out that he's actually not the villain at all. And there's a completely new villain we need to be aware of. And you think that, like, the narrative is resolving itself. And then all of a sudden, they introduce this this whole crazy new layer, which is like, no, you can go back in time and fix all this. And then you spend the last 45 minutes of the movie basically getting stuff re-explained to you. And to be able to pull that off, I think, is a feat in itself. Because there is no Harry Potter movie with a narrative this complex. And they know when to sort of drop the the jokey gags. Like, there's still some moments of levity in the whole thing. Like, when Hermione's calling the werewolf and she's like, oh, I didn't really think about the fact that he's going to chase us now. There's some really great, like, lighthearted moments there. But they know when to stop doing the gags. And so I think I can forgive the the slight little missteps along the way because it's not like they're trying to do it at crucial moments of the movie. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Bob. The The fact that they're able to chill out on that stuff lets you start focusing in on the beautiful camera work, on the beautiful shots of of nature and what's going on. That shot when Harry and Hermione first start their time traveling adventure and the camera slowly moves through this ticking yep. clock and it and it looks down on the grounds and all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, we're by those big three stones where that lead to Hagrid's hut and you you know exactly where you are. It's the stuff like that that makes this movie the stuff of legend. That shot is incredible. And what they did was, you know, they put the actors in front of a green screen, obviously, and they shot what's called a plate, which is the background. But what they did with that is they made a time lapse that was it took 40 minutes to film that background shot. But the crazy thing to me, Brad, is like how they how they finish the shot, because Harry and Hermione are standing still and everybody else is moving in the background. But then the camera swings around and follows them out of that room through the hall and it goes through a plate glass window like it is it is a crazy shot to pull off and again like you're so invested in the narrative that you're not noticing these incredible shots that are happening but if you just kind of take a step back and watch that shot second by second it's like I'm constantly amazed at how they pulled that off and I think it's perfect for the Harry Potter universe because it makes it seem like the filmmaking itself is kind of magical Honestly, that's the perfect way of putting it. This movie itself is magical, and I don't think I can talk about it anymore without getting into this Jefferson's. 
Yeah, I think we do need to take a break, Brad. I want you know I want to touch a little bit more on some of these things. I want to talk about the visual effects, the the narrative itself, the acting in this movie. But before we get there, let's try this Jefferson small batch. What do you say? Let's get to it. Hey, everybody, if you've been listening to the podcast for any length of time, then you know that I am a huge nerd when it comes to movies. But the question is, what are you nerdy about? What is a thing that makes you nerd out more than anything? Is it video games? Is it D&D like Brad? We know you have something in your life that you like to be nerdy about. And for the inner nerd in all of us, there is a place called Loot Crate. It's a subscription service that sends all kinds of different bundles directly to your door with different kinds of themes. If you're a fan of the Robots Radio Network, you may want an Elder Scrolls-themed box. You may want a Fallout box, a Marvel box. There's gaming, there's anime, there's tons of different subscription themes that you can sign up for at Loot Crate. The great part about a Loot Crate box is that they try to give you a variety of things each month that actually have more value in the box than what you would get buying each thing separately. And the best part is that we, as a part of the Robots Radio Network, are excited to be able to offer you a 15% off your first order with Loot Crate If you're interested in checking out Loot Crate, make sure you use the link in our show notes. Go to the episode that we're listening, the show notes there, and click the exclusive link that we have there. And make sure you enter the code ROBOTSRADIO at checkout. You have to do both things. Click the link and enter the code ROBOTSRADIO for 15% off your first purchase from Loot Crate. All right, so today we are checking out Jefferson's Small Batch. Now, Jefferson's is a brand of bourbon that is pretty popular across the United States. Uh, They were first launched in 1997, so they're kind of a newer brand. And their CEO, Trey Zoller, is, is known for being a really experimental guy. Like, he has taken this brand in some crazy directions that weren't being done in the bourbon industry before now. One of the things that Jefferson's is most famous for is an expression they make called Jefferson's Ocean where they put six to seven year uh, whiskey barrels on like a cargo ship and take it around the world because they say that the sloshing of the waves kind of helps extract more from the wood as they go. And like, do I have any idea if that's true? No, not really. Like it, some of it seems like marketing, sure, but it's a really cool idea and they actually do it. So Jefferson's is known for its experimentation. For a long time, this brand was uh, sourced whiskey, which means it was distilled somewhere else and they bought it and then they bottled it elsewhere. But they have actually bought their own facility, which is called uh, Kentucky Artisan Distillery. And so now what they're doing is they're kind of slowly working their own product into the mix of Jefferson's, kind of like what happened with Bardstown Bourbon Company. So now it's like 75 percent sourced whiskey mixed with 25 percent of their own stuff. Today, we're checking out the Jefferson Small Batch, which is kind of the entry level point for Jefferson's. It is an 82.3 proof bourbon. I don't have a mash bill, so I don't actually know, you know, what what's going on in here. But Brad, maybe you can help me out with that. What are you picking up on the nose of this Jefferson Small Batch? Well, Bob, I, I will say having had four different expressions of the ocean, uh, Jefferson's Ocean, maybe yeah. even five now. One of them was like, okay, not great. One of them was good. One of them was really good. And the last one was really great. It was their cast strength, I think, Voyage 19. So like in general, I've been impressed by the Jefferson's line so far. Um, On this specific uh, juice, I think that I'm getting the most normal classic bourbon expression of all of the of all the whiskeys I've had from Jefferson so far it's there's a little bit of light oakiness um the color isn't incredibly deep but it's a nice light beautiful kind of golden brown and then uh, as the nose kind of finishes for me I get a little bit of corn it, it smells a little bit young um uh, but I I think I do get a few floral notes in there that I that I'm just there's just hints of them it, it's a pretty simple easy nose yeah I have to say Brad I've had a lot of the Jefferson's Ocean I actually have a sample on my shelf right now 
but it's probably the only expression of the Jefferson's line that I really, really like a lot. And I, I that's confirmed for me when I'm nosing this. This one is is very bright. It's more yellow in the glass than it is kind of that golden, amber, darker colored bourbon that we like to see. And in the glass, it's it's kind of astringent. It almost smells kind of cheap, if I'm being honest with you. And I spent a long time trying to figure out, like, what's the prominent note here aside from alcohol? And I got a couple fruit notes. I got some apple peel. Like, there's that really great scent of, like, a dark red apple peel. But then I was like, man, what is that? It's almost like it's alcohol forward, but kind of watery and, and maybe a little yeasty. And it has some citrus. And <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh, this whiskey smells like a high proof version of a Bud Light Lime. <laughs> and like, I don't know if that is a good note or not, but it definitely smells like cheap beer flavored with some citrus to me. Bob, in in ye olden days of Brad G's life, I, I enjoyed me a Bud Light Lime when I was, you know, 21. Yeah, I mean, do you... that, that was something I drank. I man, I don't know if that's totally a fair comparison. But are you kind of picking up what what I'm what I'm getting here? Like it it almost has a beery kind of smell to it and not necessarily like a good beer. It just this smells cheap to me, Brad. Um I I don't know if I'm at that point with you, Bob. I uh. I think I'm going to disagree a little bit. It it doesn't smell cheap to me. You know, I, I feel like I've smelt cheap whiskey before. Um we did a whole springtime for it. Uh, the springtime of swill, you can go back and listen to from season 2. But this one doesn't smell cheap to me, but I am picking up a little bit on those kind of fruity notes. Um, it, it's not a great nose. It's very simple. It doesn't lead me a lot of places, but it's not bad. I'm going to give it a six out of 10 on the nose. Yeah, I think I'm right about there, Brad. I'm going to give it a five and a half on the nose. All right. Let's keep on going with the Bud Light of whiskeys, according <laughs> to Bob. Bud Light Lime, my friend. You know, honestly, Brad, the crazy thing about the way this tastes is that it tastes kind of like an Irish whiskey. We've we've tried a couple Irish whiskeys in the past few weeks uh, together, just like off air. And it has that kind of a scotch that's been drained of flavor. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just kind of a flat experience for me when I drink Irish whiskey, unless we get a really good one. And this kind of has that. It doesn't have the sweetness of a bourbon. It has some of the maltiness that you would get with an Irish whiskey. It's got some really good smoke and char uh, right after you swallow that that linger in my mouth. I tried it out of a rocks glass, too, in addition to the one that I usually drink out of. And in that one, I got a little bit more classic bourbon, um, and it has this really herbal sort of back-end finish. But it doesn't taste like a bourbon to me. It ta- If you had put this in front of me and said, try this new Irish whiskey, I, I would probably think that this was like a slightly sweeter version of an Irish whiskey. Yeah, I for this one, it almost reminds me a little bit of Rebel Yell that we tried a little while back. Do you remember we said that that one kind of tasted like cherry cola? Yeah. that That's kind of what I'm, I'm getting here. Oh, interesting. There's little hints of cherry. There's just not a lot going on here, Bob. It, there's some flavors. It has a slight kind of cherry cola taste to me. But outside of that, I, you know, there's a little bit of vanilla. There's a little bit of oakiness um, on the back end. But it's just okay. I'm I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10 on the flavor. Yeah, I'll go ahead and give it a 5.5 again. Like, it's not unpleasant. It's just kind of neutral tasting. I don't know if that's a good word for it, but, like, there's just not a lot popping on this. And as you get to the finish, man, this is one of the shortest finishes I have ever had on a whiskey. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, Bob, but this thing goes down your palate. It does give you a little Kentucky hug for a minute. Oh, it definitely does. But outside of that Kentucky hug... I don't know if I taste anything. And once again, the flavor is just kind of missing. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, the, the predominant note for me on the finish is just oak. Like, it just kind of tastes like wood. And there's there's no lingering flavor from the whiskey itself other than that. And you're right, Brad. It, I mean, it's pretty short. I actually think that it leaves a, a kind of a bitter oaky taste in my mouth for a little bit longer than I'd like. But in terms of leaving anything besides that, it is a very short finish. I don't really like that. I'm going to go ahead and give it a, oh gosh, a four and a half on the finish. Yeah, Bob, I'm going to give it a four on the finish. I'm really disappointed. All you get is a little bit of oak, maybe some vanilla sweetness on the end. But it, it finishes so fast that the flavor dissipates. And all I'm left with is a little bit of, you know, a pleasant burn in my throat. And, and that's about it. 
All right, well, that takes us to overall balance. Brad, I feel like we're kind of just breezing through this one today, but I, there's really not a lot to say here. It's it's just it's a low proof whiskey that punches above its weight in terms of alcohol delivery. Like it's there, there's a lot of alcohol on this. It, it gives you that burn and that Kentucky hug going down. There's just not a lot of flavor being delivered here. And so in terms of balance, like, I don't know, is it a, is it well balanced? Because we didn't get a lot on the nose. We didn't get a lot on the taste. We definitely didn't get a lot on the finish. I really was hoping for something a little bit more based on those fruit notes I got in the nose. And I think it kind of went downhill from there. But if you remember, the nose score that I gave was five and a half. So if that's your peak, this is just not that great of a whiskey. So I don't know. I'm, I'm going to give it a five and a half on balance. I don't think that anything really jumped out in a negative way, you know, on, on any one of those things. So it's fairly well balanced. It's just not that good. I'm right there with you, Bob. I, I'm going to give it a five out of 10 on balance. The, this whiskey just struggles in all, all of our categories. Honestly, though, Bob, like it's not like this is a terrible whiskey. It's not bad in any way. It just doesn't impress in any way. This might sound (laughs) this might sound weird, but like I think this might be the most average bourbon ever made. I will say that I think this would appeal to the crowd of like old granddad and four roses drinkers. It's definitely more on that sort of spicy alcohol burn spectrum than it is on the really sweet caramel peanut butter spectrum. So if you're really big into a whiskey that bites, like this might be up your alley. But I think Brad and I have both kind of proven ourselves that that's that's not really where our palates are. It's not what we prefer in a bourbon, which brings us to overall value. This costs thirty one ninety nine in the state of Ohio, which is not a bad price. Honestly, Brad, like, you know, this is not as mass produced as some of the whiskeys out there. Um, it is sourced and you know, that it's a brand known for experimentation. So, I mean, I don't know. Would you pay more for this than you would for Four Roses Yellow Label? Like, to me, they're pretty comparable. And Four Roses is like $21, and this is $31. I don't know, Brad. I- I'm, still, I'm still trying to figure out what kind of score I want to give it on value. But what are you thinking? Honestly, Bob, I, I think this bourbon is worth about $18 to $21. Um, so 31 is massively overpriced for the product you're getting. I'm going to give it a two out of 10. on Wow. Wow. You know, I think I'm going to give it a five out of 10. I'm just, I'm so neutral on this bourbon that I I think I'm just going to stick it all around a five for every score. If this kind of thing is up your alley, you might be willing to spend $31 on it. I would probably direct you to like an old granddad bottled in bond. If this is your flavor profile, you like above this and you'd be paying less for that. So that takes my final score out to a 26 out of 50. Brad, what's it bringing you to? I'm at a 22 out of 50. All right. So that takes us to an average of a 24 out of 50. We are below the halfway point on this one. Um, I'm not going to recommend. This is just not the kind of flavor profile that I go in for on a bourbon. It might be yours. And if you really dig Jefferson Small Batch, then you should give us a call or write into us and tell us what it is that, that makes you really love this product. I think I just know myself well enough that I don't see myself really ever reaching for this one. Yeah, Bob, this isn't a whiskey that I'm interested in in going to, you know, going to the well over and over and over to get this stuff. So in the end, I'm going to leave this one to the side, not recommend, but I, I do highly recommend Alfonso Cuaron in The Prisoner of Azkaban. So what say you, we get back to it. Let's do it, Brad. So that was Jefferson's small batch. We are getting back into talking about Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. And Brad, you said it perfectly in the first half. We have been heaping praise on this movie. I haven't even gotten into talking about that great sequence on the train when the Dementors first invade and how much of that sequence was inspired. I mean, at least in my opinion, by the T-Rex sequence in Jurassic Park. Like it is just a perfectly executed sort of horror tension scene. 
Are there any other moments in the movie, Brad? You know, we talked about some great shots, some great sequences. Anything else that you really want to call attention to just as being spectacular filmmaking in this movie? Bob, we we kind of touched on it just just a hint earlier, but I think the scene where Harry finally conjures his first, you know, fully formed Patronus and fights off the Dementors that are killing past time version of himself and Sirius on the edge of the lake, that moment is just incredibly yeah. beautiful. Yeah. You know, the the sound direction of that moment, the sound engineering is perfect. Everything goes silent. There is literally not another sound in the world. Daniel Radcliffe's performance in that moment when he runs forward and he takes a breath and he just screams, you know, the the spell he just there's something about that moment the the light design the the visual effect of that moment of this shield protecting harry and sirius uh, watching the dementors flutter and hit against it and and go away the 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 heavenly chorus that you know these this angelic voices that come out that moment might be one of the best filmed moment from an all-around perspective. Everything that happened in that moment was perfect. It might be the most perfect moment in the Harry Potter franchise. Yeah, Brad, I, I completely agree. And what I love with Quaron's direction there is the way that he physically manifests the spells. And I, I, I said this earlier, but I want to call attention to it again. You know, in the first two movies, you've got people shooting sparks out of their wands. Everything sounds like a zap. In this one, the Patronus charm especially, it creates this like almost cone-shaped thing and it ripples and it waves like water. And you're completely right. In that crucial moment where you could have these really triumphant horns coming in and ba da 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 it just, everything else gets kind of muted and everything is restrained. And it really allows the emotion of that moment to shine through and it's not drowned out by like bombast. You know what I mean? And I think... That's really where Quaron shines as a filmmaker, where other people who may have made this movie might not have, you know, made that directorial choice. And I, I feel like a broken record. We just keep heaping praise on Quaron here. But you called attention to Daniel Radcliffe's performance. And I think it is probably time we at least mention someone's acting in this movie. I think Radcliffe really turned a corner between two and three. Potter. What are you doing, wandering the corridors at night? I'm a sleepwalker. How extraordinarily like your father you are, Potter. He too was exceedingly arrogant, strutting about the castle. My dad didn't strut, and nor do I. Now, if you don't mind, I would appreciate it if you could lower your wand. Like, his acting in this movie is leaps and bounds better, and I noticed it really early on, In his early confrontations with his uncle Vernon, where, you know, Vernon's like, you can't do magic outside of school. And he's like, yeah, try me. And I was like, oh, oh, you're really good at conveying sass now, Harry Potter. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? (laughs) He got a little bit of James Dean in him. Yeah. And, you know, he still has his limitations. Like, he's still very bad at crying. He still does the, like, breathing through his teeth thing that he does sometimes. But, But of the child performances especially, I thought Radcliffe really turned a corner in this movie. Oh, he he took a huge step forward. I was really, really impressed with him in this movie. And and as we go through these movies, I think you start to recognize that different actors, it almost feels like they all take different leaps forward in their acting ability and the quality of their acting as the movies go on. So, Brad, with a with a movie this big, like there's there's tons of people in this movie. And I actually wish that we saw more of McGonagall and more of Snape in this movie. But I want to focus on two new additions to this movie. You know, there's a few new characters, but the main one being Gary Oldman as Sirius Black. I don't have much to say. He's fantastic. We all know that he's fantastic. Do you have any thoughts on Sirius Black or Gary Oldman's performance as Sirius? You know, uh, going into this movie, I have always said that I don't care for Gary Oldman as Sirius Black. Uh, For some reason, in the later films, he just... He never has come across the way I thought of Sirius Black in the books, and so I really struggled with him as Sirius. However, in watching this film again, I think that when when Gary Oldman is playing the demented horror film escaped prisoner role, he is at, at the peak of his game. 
Tell me about Peter Pettigrew. He was at school with us. We thought he was our friend. No. Pettigrew's dead. You killed him. No, he didn't. I thought so too until you mentioned seeing Pettigrew on the map. The map was lying then. The map never lies. Pettigrew's alive. And he's right there. Hey, it's mental. No, I'm confused. You're right. This cabs has been in my family for 12 years. Curiously long life for a common garden rat. He's missing a toe, isn't he? So what? All I could find of Pettigrew was his finger. The dirty cow would come and that everyone would think he was gay. And then he transformed into a rat. Show me. But literally, the moment that he, like, calms down and is, like, calmly talking to Harry about, you know, possibly living with him and stuff like that, I lose interest in him right away. Oh, interesting. And I, I just struggle with normal Gary Oldman as Sirius Black. You know, when, when he's playing the crazed demented part, perfect. I love it. But there and, and I will say in this movie, the switch from him being absolutely crazy and, you know, just have having lost his mind to being completely sane and normal and like, you know, has no problems at all with his sanity. I was kind of like, wait a second. Yeah. Like just that that switch was really, really, really fast. I agree with that much. And I think that's actually a problem that carries over from the books, too. That's not even a Gary Oldman problem in my mind. I think he plays it well. It's a scripting problem and it's a source material problem because, you know, Sirius Black doesn't come into the books until the third book and he's the villain of that book until two thirds of the way through. And then all of a sudden he's Harry's best. Like Harry is enamored with this guy. And if you watch the movie, all he really says is like, you know, I'm here to protect you and I was friends with your dad. And Harry's like fawning over him. And Sirius yeah. immediately becomes one of the most important characters in the whole franchise. And I've never quite bought, like dramatically speaking, from from a you know from a story construction standpoint, it's always seemed really rushed to me. It's like, who is this guy? He just got here. How is he this important already? And so you know, spoilers for book and movie number five. But like when Sirius dies, it never affected me the way that it affected a lot of Harry Potter fans, I guess, because his arc is so small across the, you know the whole span of the series. And so, yeah, I don't really think it's a Gary Oldman problem for me as much as it's a a scripting pacing problem. Yeah, uh, Bob, I'm actually right there with you. When when Sirius passes away, when I read that for the first time and in the subsequent times that I've read that, it's never really hit me that hard. Mm -mm. I, like Sirius has never stood out to me as like a super important character even though I know that Rowling wanted it to be that way. Right. I I just he dies and I'm kind of like Oh, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, you know, the other big addition to this cast is the actor who played Dumbledore in the first two movies, Richard Harris, passed away. They had to replace him. There were rumors that they ap approached Ian McKellen, which he has confirmed. Uh, Ian McKellen said no. He didn't want to play another wizard, which is understandable. So they, they chose this British actor named Michael Gambon. And Gambondor, as he's come to be known, is is really hated by a lot of Harry Potter fans. That's Bob. That's because he is the worst. All right. Listen, let me finish my point first. I've never been one of them. I think that he plays the character well. And I think that if they had if they had had a consistent idea for what Dumbledore was supposed to be across the seven or eight movies, it would have been better. But he's so drastically different from Richard Harris that it's it's kind of jarring. And that, that goes all the way down to his costumes. You know, Quaron said he wanted him to have a really light kind of silky costume that provided a lot of, you know, movement, whereas Richard Harris was basically wearing curtains and just like heavy drapes all over the place. I, I will say, Brad, when we get to the Goblet of Fire, I am going to rake Michael Gambon over the coals. But I think in this movie, Quaron did the best he could do in terms of trying to bridge the gap. Like... Michael Gambon, clearly not as old, clearly not as frail as Richard Harris was, but they don't have him like, like in the fourth movie, he's like whipping his head around and running and like he's, he's way too agile. In this one, it, it at least seems like his movements are like deliberate and slower. And I, I didn't have as big of a problem with the shift in this particular movie as I did in others. Bob, I, as, as an avid Michael Gambon hater, and I, I will fully admit to that, and I won't change my position on it, I will say he wasn't that bad in this movie. You know, I think it's partially because you don't see him very much, 
Um, but also, like like you said, he does have an air of mystery about him in this movie that I'm like, OK, yeah, like I'm I'm kind of fine with him in this film. While it wasn't bad, it, it didn't like inspire anything in me. There's nothing about his performance in this movie that made me go, oh, my gosh, this is Dumbledore. I like Richard Harris as Dumbledore, but I don't know why they ever cast him as Dumbledore. Like when he started the film series, he was incredibly old. He, as a human being, was very decrepit. And so I'm not totally sure why they cast him in the first place. But there's no way that Richard Harris could have finished this whole series, you know, and and obviously he passed away in the middle of it, which is super unfortunate. Well, you know, part of it, too, is like and I don't want to get into Richard Harris's personal life here, but like the, the man was a hard drinker. He hung out with Peter O'Toole all the time and all they did was drink. Uh, Richard Harris in, in the first film, Brad, was only like 70 or 71 years old. Like he looks 90, but he died at age 72. So if that tells you anything about the way he took care of his body. If you saw that man as Dumbledore, you would swear he was 97 years old. Yeah, I I, I actually did think he was about 107 years old. <laughs> Brad, before we give our final scores, I, I want to move into one more thing. And every time a John Williams score comes up, I always have to ask you your opinion because I know how much you love John Williams. This is the last film in the Harry Potter series that John Williams himself composes and scores. And I think that it's it's really fantastic. It's a lot more subtle than the first two. You know, in the first two movies, John Williams is in full like Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Spielberg mode. Big theme, big theme, really memorable theme. But in this one, the themes are way more restrained. And I think they match what's actually going on on screen better. I don't really know a lot of people that queue up like the Prisoner of Azkaban soundtrack because there's not a lot of recognizable Harry Potter musical themes in it. But in a way, I think that actually works better for what's happening on screen. Yeah, the John Williams takes what's happening in this specific world, the specific world of Prisoner of Azkaban, and he gives so many beautiful, soft moments that allow you to deal with the the mystery that's happening around you. You know, I, I think that's what struck me most about this movie is that, yes, Quaron kind of introduces some horror elements, you know, the the hand of the Dementor gripping the door one finger at a time, right, on the, on the train yeah, at the start. Yeah. So he introduces these horror elements, but in all reality, this is a mystery film. This is kind of a whodunit, where is Sirius Black, when is he going to strike type of movie. Yeah, even the time travel part even is like that. Even the time travel part does that. So I think Williams matches that mysterious feel that like, sure, all you know, any any movie about wizards and magic should feel slightly mysterious because it's not like normal life. But in this one, I think Williams just delves perfectly into what it means to just kind of dabble with music, to just kind of dabble with a soft theme. It's a beautiful score that, uh, Bob, I'm glad you brought it up because it deserves mentioning as a great part of this film. And honestly, I think if, if I'm going to pull any moment from it, too, the the theme that he does for Buckbeak, like when Buckbeak is flying, is just a beautiful theme. And mm. <laughs> if, you, if you need calmed down today, go to Spotify, pull up Buckbeak's theme from the Prisoner of Azkaban soundtrack. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. But but Brad, I think it's time for us to get into our final scores. And here's my struggle with this movie. You know, I've been praising it for almost an hour now. And yet at the same time, I think there's a part of me, like the movie critic part of me, is very much aware that this is the best directed movie in the whole franchise. From a filmmaking point of view, this is the best movie in the franchise. What Quaron pulled off, both, you know, just visually and also delivering such a complex narrative that involves time travel. You know, there's mystery elements, there's horror elements. It's not as straightforward as the rest of the stories are. And yet, just from knowing the whole total arc of the Harry Potter series, this is the only book, the only story where Voldemort doesn't show up. And a part of me has always felt like, wow, couldn't we have just like wedged this in somewhere else in one of the other books? The whole point of this book is Harry meets Sirius Black. But again, Sirius dies two books later. So it's kind of like, what was the point of all this? It's a really fun diversion. It's cool to see how time travel works in the world of, of witchcraft and wizardry. But it's always just seemed like the least essential story to the overall arc or plot of the series. And I struggle with that. I do think that this is an incredibly well-directed movie, though. And I can't fault Quaron for the fact that, like, 
in the grand scheme of things, this story isn't as essential as other ones are. I do think this is the best made film in the series. And Brad, I'm going to come out to a 9 out of 10 on this movie. It is just, it's a fantastic movie. And it's one of those movies that, like, do you need to see the first two to understand what's going on? Probably. But it's also the one that I think would appeal the most to people who wouldn't necessarily be Harry Potter fans. For the exact reasons that you said. It's, it's more of a mystery. It's a whodunit. It's a time travel movie. There's, there's a lot of fun stuff going on that you don't get elsewhere in the series. And so for that reason, I think it's a nine for me. Man, Bob, you, you just said a lot of things. And I have lots and lots of thoughts. <laughs> But I will say, I think I realize one of my favorite parts about this movie is the fact that it has time travel in it, but it's not a movie about time travel. You know what yeah. I mean? Like how like how many movies have you watched where like if time travel is a part of the movie, that's like what the whole movie is about. Well, honestly, is about the time travel element. Like the, the, the whole time I was watching this, I was comparing it to Avengers Endgame. Because, like, you know, and I've said this before, I'm not a big fan of Endgame. I think it was a really sloppy made movie. And the time travel element of that movie, I think, is done so much worse than the time travel element of this one. But you're right, Brad. Like, in both those movies, it's not really about time travel, but this one pulls it off so much better. Much, much better. So I, I really love the time travel element. You know, Bob, I, you, you say that this is, like, the least important story but in a certain sense, I really think that this is one of the most important stories in understanding Harry's development uh, psychologically. Like if if you don't have this promise of a happy home, if you don't have this hope instilled in Harry that he might have a normal life, then the rest of the series isn't as crushing as and as important as it is. Like by the end of the series, you know, and we're obviously going into all sorts of spoilers here, but like by the end of the series, Harry knows that he has to die, that in order for Voldemort to be defeated, Harry has to perish in this conflict. And so if you don't have the prisoner of Azkaban, you don't ever have that promise, that hope of a normal future where sure, my parents might have died, but I can live with my godfather who was their best friend in the world and have some semblance of a normal life. You know, my whole life up until this point has been one surprise after another. It's been tr I've been treated terribly by the Dursleys till I was 11. And then I'm introduced into this magical world. But even in this magical world, I find out that, oh, I have this mortal enemy that wants to kill me. And then... All of a sudden, you have this hope that Harry grasps onto of, well, maybe I could have a normal life. And so for that reason, I, I really do think that The Prisoner of Azkaban is a completely necessary story that if you don't have this story, then all you have is doom and gloom. Voldemort's going to kill me. So I, I don't know, man. I, I really love that part of this story. Um, and like we said, the with the movie itself. There are this this is the most beautiful of the eight movies. I, I really can't say enough. Um, for me, this is a nine and a half out of ten. I, I really, really love this film. And I was a little surprised. I, Prison of Azkaban is probably the one I had seen the least out of the eight other than maybe the the sixth one. And so so, yeah, I came into this a little bit just kind of like, OK, we'll see where Coron goes. And I was just blown away. Well, there you have it. It's a 9.25 average for us. And I think that's totally appropriate, Brad. This is just a fantastic film all around. But we want to know what you think. So please, interact with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, at Film Whiskey. Or you can give us a call. Our phone number is 216-800-5923. Once again, that number is 216-800-5923. If you want to let us know your thoughts and have them played on air... Please give us a call or find us on anchor.fm. Look us up. You can record your message right on the website. So go ahead and do that. Next week, we will be back with the follow up to this movie. We're looking at Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. So please join us for the fourth Harry Potter film next week for the Film and Whiskey podcast. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. We'll see you next time. Bye.